All right. So let me get started then. Is that okay, Chris? Five seconds. Okay. Go. <laughs> Uh, that's necessary too. I'm sorry. Sorry about. From from Slack. Projecting two slides. Oh, okay. Sharing screen. Okay. What are you trying to do? Okay, go. <laughs> Ready? Yes. All right. Okay, so welcome back to the last lecture on a Friday. Well, it's not the last lecture for you, but it's the last lecture for me. So, uh, and actually, you have student talks in the evening, so it's a very long day, but you know, it's Friday and you get Sunday off, so. Look forward to that. All right, so let's recap some things from lecture number two. So remember that we had this nice little table of the TMD PDFs, there were eight of them, and that when we measured spin polarization that we got more ac access to more information. One thing I didn't mention uh, with the table is that if I didn't have TMD, if I didn't have transverse momentum, some of these objects still exist as longitudinal PDFs. In particular, the ones on the diagonal, the unpolarized, the holicity, and the transversity, the ones without any decorations, just F1, G1, H1, those ones exist. Uh, but the other ones actually really require transverse momentum even to exist. And, uh, you can see that from the earlier formulas we talked about in lecture two. <laughs> also recap that the sign flip uh, for the ones on the far corners here, Sivers and Bone Mulders, sign flips from uh, the CITES process to drill yan, and that's definitely a target. Uh, one thing that'll be important later in my lecture is that remember that these functions are also differing for all the quark flavors. So they're up, down, strange, up, U bar, D bar, S bar. These, these functions have a, a flavor index on them. And so we would like to actually measure them just like we measure for PDFs, all the different flavors of TMD as well. Um, and then finally, you know, the same thing for fragmentation functions. We are only talking about these two, the unpolarized and, and the Collins here, uh, which are on these two entries. And again, they have flavor dependence in general. So uh, before I get going on some phenomenology, which is sort of the main goal of today's lecture, I want to talk about one little interesting thing. And this is related to the handbook in check, section 2.9 of the handbook. And that addresses the following question, which is sort of fundamental to thinking about the TMD uh, PDF as kind of probability of finding a quark with a certain momentum inside the proton. If that really was absolutely correct, then you'd expect that if I integrate over the transverse momentum of the T TMD PDF, so let's just think about that integral. So here's our renormalized function, and I'm thinking about this integral. If I were to integrate over it, you'd expect that then it's the same as think, just thinking about measuring the longitudinal PDF. Now, at the bare level, I mentioned uh, a couple lectures ago that that is a true statement. But at the renormalized level, it's a very questionable statement. Naively, if you just had this probability and interp interpretation, you might say, well, you know, it should be true. There should be some way in which it's true, but maybe it's not. Maybe that's just too naive. There's a different ways in which it's, it's naive. 
what is that the limits of the integral here go to infinity? And as KT goes to infinity, that's the ultraviolet region. And actually this TMD blows up, the integral of it blows up as, as KT goes to infinity. So that certainly is making this a too naive statement. Um, another, another obvious thing from the formula that makes it too naive is the fact that the left-hand side has a zeta and the right-hand side doesn't. So, you know, what's going on with that? And it's even worse than that because the left-hand side has a mu that the right-hand side also has, but the mu dependence on the left and the right-hand side are actually different. The RGEs in mu of the TMD is actually quite different from the RGE for the longitudinal PDF. One, for example, the longitudinal PDF involves flavor mixing, whereas the TMD uh, does not. I'll write that equation down in a little bit. So th these kind of things, if I sort of keep going, if I think about them, they say, well, the answer should be no. Um, but in fact, if uh, one can show that there is a, a statement that can be made, and this is discussed in section 2.9 of the handbook, and the state that, statement that can be made is the following, that if you cut off the integral at some value, and that value is large enough, so it's not like really deep in the non-perturbative region, so a few GeV-ish, or maybe five GeV, 10 GeV, 10 GeV is safe. Uh, then, and we integrate this thing where we set the cutoffs, the, the renormalization scale by the same cutoff on the integral, so it's being set by a perturbative scale. And we set the zeta, the rapidity cutoff, which remember had dimension two, again, by the same cutoff. Then to a very good approximation, this is equal to the longitudinal PDF with that same value from you. Um, and it's true at the percent level, actually. And this plot that I'm showing you here is an example of that for the D quark. So it's what the plot is showing is it's showing this integral divided by this, subtracting one. So it should be zero if everything is working. And you can see that right near the center of the cutoffs, which is here where the star is, that things are agreeing very well at the kind of percent level. Contours here are like 5% out. So once you go out that far, it's differing by 5% as indicated by the ticks uh, on this chart. So it's certainly not true for all values of the cutoff, mu cutoff and the zeta cutoff, but at the sort of canonical cutoffs that you might guess, it's actually a true statement that this distribution can be integrated to that. So the answer is both yes and no. It's yes here and then no far away when the cutoffs are very different. And if you want more information about this little thing that I've showed you, this. This plot comes from a work that I did uh, with Sikhman Stan, who's going to talk to you in the evening talks tonight. So you can listen to her talk uh, to hear more about that, that plot and what goes into making it, which is non-trivial. All right, so let me now turn to doing some setup for phenomenology. Um, actually, if there's any question about that, I'll take a question, but I'm going to then turn to phenomenology. I can see the audience more this time, so. So we introduced all these spin-dependent TMDs, but we didn't yet say how we're gonna measure them all. So let me talk about how we're gonna measure them. So let's go back to Drellian, which we already talked about, but we'll now talk about again. And this time when I talk about Drellian, I wanna think about polarization. So when I think about the proton now, I'm going to think about the fact that it carries a, a spin vector, like we talked about, and it can be polarized, and I can use that information. Um, for simplicity, I'll think about pion proton scattering, which is one process where the spin dependence and the polarization has been tracked. Uh, and so we have to define some angular distributions here in order to get at the spin information. And there's different ways of doing it. Angles are not a frame independent concept. So we have to pick a frame and then define the angles and then do a decomposition of the cross section in that frame. So let's just do that. So the angles, theta, phi, and phi s, those will be the angles that I, the three angles that will be relevant here. 
those three angles are shown in this figure. And so we use what's called the Colin Soper frame. So defined in the Colin Soper frame. And the Colin Soper frame is shown by this figure, but to set it up, the, what we do is as follows. We sort of say, well, the L plus L minus, which the Drelian pair are producing, E plus E minus, mu plus mu minus, let's take them to be at rest. So combine their at rest, that means they're back to back. And in this figure, you're supposed to imagine that the leptons are back to back. Um, and then let's also take the, pro, the hadronic things, which are the, the pions transverse momentum and the protons transverse momentum equal. So they have to add up to the, uh, uh, sorry, we'll take them equal to QT over two. So half the, the transverse momentum of the gamma star. Okay, so that's again, some choice. And that defines for you the Colin Soper frame. So in that frame, you have sort of your, your pion and your proton coming in, uh, and then those two vectors define a hadronic frame. And then you have your leptons going out and that defines a leptonic frame. Those, the, and those two frames are at some angle relative to each other. Uh, uh, there's an angle phi that is the tilt of those frames relative to one another. There's an angle theta, which is the angle to one of the leptons. And then there's a spin polarization vector. Remember that the spin of the proton is an, another variable and there's a, a transverse part of that is a vector in two dimensional space. So there's an angle associated to it and a magnitude. And we call the angle phi s. So that's the third angle. Okay, so given these three angles, we can study this cross section more differentially than we've done before. And I, I'm gonna study it, not in full glory, but just the leading power terms. So we're gonna still think about the expansion that we've been doing, i.e. QT much less than Q, and look at the leading power terms. Now, before I get into any kind of TMD factorization, I can think about structure functions. There's more structure functions if I do a complete decomposition, but let's just think about the, the ones that will matter for this talk. And that's the ones that are shown in the formula here, uh, which are relevant for the pi on proton case. These structure functions are functions in QCD that I can define just using the symmetries of QCD for the hadronic, separating the hadronic and leptonic, and then just seeing what I get. All the angle dependence comes out of these functions. They just depend on the hadronic things, like the X for the pion, the X for the proton. These are the X variables in the Drelian process, what we called XA and XB before. Uh, the transverse momentum, Q, but they don't depend on the angles. So the angular dependence can be used to extract different structure functions, which are these things that show up in this formula. And as you can see, there's different angular weights in front of all these terms. Also highlighted in orange is the fact that the spin polarization allows you to get access uh, to different terms here in this as well. Since, uh, and it, um, we have both the longitudinal and transverse spins showing up. Uh, in this formula, the Fs have some nomenclature. You can see that the superscript is related to the angular weight. So it's just a reminder of what were the angles that multiplied that thing. The first index here is related to the fact that pions don't have spin, so they're unpolarized. So there's always a U there. If we considered scattering two protons, we can that were both polarized, we could have a more complicated set of Fs, but here the pions are unpolarized. There's always a U in the first index. And then the second index is for the proton, and that can be polarized or not. And so this is the polarization of the proton. Uh, so that's the, the structure function conventions. Now, TMD factorization makes predictions for these Fs. So I go through and I turn the crank in the way that I've described to you, and we get some formulas. These formulas are most useful in BT space, or most easy theoretically in BT space. So I'm writing them down for you in BT space. Um, so how does this work? So I have this object B that takes two TMD PDFs, but they can be from that table, they can be one of you know the eight PMD PDFs. There's one for the pion, one for the proton, pions are unpolarized. So anyway, so they're always gonna be of two different types. They're either gonna be an F1 or an H1 perp because those are the unpolarized entries, but there's more possibilities for the proton. Um, and then they get integrated together in BT space with some, one of these Bessel functions that we talked about, um, and then some hard scattering. And that's what this function B does. It just sort of takes those two TMD PDFs and then uh, integrates them uh, 
with the QT, that's like doing the Fourier transform, but I did the phi integral because these things are scalars. They're just a function of the magnitude of BT, all, these, all the functions in that table. Uh, so that's what the B does. It sort of implements the factorization. Um, and then we have this very simple formula where the different structure functions are, are connected to different, we can measure different TMDs from them. So for the first example here, we have unpolarized for both TMDs. So I'll call that unpolarized squared. In the second example here, these are the bohr molders functions, is H1 perps. So I uh, call this bohr molders squared. In this third entry here, we've got another bohr molder. So let me put quotes. But then we've got this H1L, that's the worm gear. Okay, so you get the idea. We, from these different terms, we can measure different TMDs. Let me just keep going. Why not? This is unpolarized times sivers. Sivers for the proton. So that's interesting. We have bohr molders again and transversity. And then finally, we have bohr molders and what's called pretzel oxy. Uh, a mouthful. It's like a pretzel. A pretzel to say, too. Say it 10 times fast over dinner. So you get access to all these TMDs from having a polarized process. So that's very interesting. Um, you could do the same thing in, in, in semi-inclusive DIS. So it's not just you know, that we play this game in Julianne and then we're done. We can also play it in semi-inclusive DIS. So let me you know, keep going and describe. It's even in, in some ways more powerful here. Uh, in this case, we're going to polarize the, the incoming lepton beam, so the electron beam and then also the target, the proton. So our, our electrons are, you know, they're very light, so we're gonna treat them as if they're massless. So this is a massless electron. And that means as far as spin is concerned that we just have a holicity, which is this lambda. This is lambda is like plus or minus a half along the direction of motion for a massless lepton. The proton is massive, so we have transverse and, and longitudinal spin. Uh, that's the S as usual here. And then the final state hadron again will be unpolarized. So think of it like a pion. Okay, so let's think about the semi-inclusive DIS process, but now it's been polarized. Again, we have to think about angles. That's how we're gonna get access to the spin information and angles require a frame. So we need a frame for the angles in this process. The angles in this process are gonna be what's called phi H and phi S. And again, the frame that we use is what's in this case called the Trento convention. So some convention that's defined in a particular way. The Q of the momentum exchange of the virtual photon is defined to be along the z-axis. The space like Q defines the z-axis. And then the lepton are taken to be in the xz plane. So that's what's shown in this figure. You see that the z axis here uh, is along the direction of the q, and then the x axis is the other axis that defines this, this that's defined by the plane of the leptons that are scattering. Um, and then again, uh, I have a hadron. The hadron has some transverse momentum and it has some total momentum. That's the pH here and the pHT. And there's a hadronic plane uh, that's the green plane here. And phi h is the angle of the leptonic plane to the hadronic plane. And then the hadrons are also in the transverse plane having a spin vector, the two-dimensional transverse spin vector. And there's an angle associated to that spin vector. That's the phi s again, same kind of notation as we had in draw yeah, a minute ago. And again, I'm going to consider uh, the, the small transverse momentum limit, but I'm also going to consider my q's to be smaller than w's and z masses, just so I don't have to take into account z exchange or uh, and I'll work to leading order in, in Q, Q much less than Q. So again, we can describe this QCD process with structure functions. So we have Fs, capital Fs, that are a function of hadronic variables, X. Remember that semi-inclusive DIS had the ZH, which is kind of like an X, but for the fragmentation process. And then there's a transverse momentum, which is the transverse momentum of the hadron, as well as Q squared. So the angles come out. And so we have these structure functions that 
uh, in th this case, we have one, two, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of them that, that show up at, in leading order in the QT much less than Q. And we have some angular weights to them. Um, and again, the notation is very simple, similar to what we had above. So the, the indices U, U and L in this formula, U, L, and T in this formula are just indicating the polarization. So the, now we have both possibility of electron being polarized and protons. So we have beam polarization, i.e. electron beam polarization, which is the lambda. And then we also have the proton polarization. It's often called the target, fixed target. Uh, the third index isn't that important, so I'm not going to talk about it. This, um, this little p's that are showing up in the formula are just some function of the DIS variable y, so the, you know whatever some kinematic factors, and then you see these spin vectors, the SL and the ST for the proton and the lambda spin polarization of the electron is giving you access to, to these terms of the lambda in front. All right, so very interesting. You get a bunch of different structure functions. Factorization, again, uh, in B space, tells us that we can tie together this kind of TMD fragmentation function and a TMD part time distribution function. So Fs and Ds now in the semi inclusive DIS process. And that in all these different structure functions, a different combination shows up. So by measuring all of these, these terms, we get. At, all this information about the, the TMDs and the, and the fragmentation functions. So once again, we can sort of go through and classify what's what. So, you know, unpolarized, squared. Uh, we have your bohr molders times the Collins. Remember that our fragmentation function is either unpolarized or Collins. So there's only two point choices for the fragmentation function, but many choices for the proton. This, this one here is what, what's called worm gear, and it's times Collins. This is the helicity one, and it's times unpolarized for the fragmentation. This one here is worm gear times unpolarized. This one here for completeness, we'll go through all of them. Transversity. Collins, Sivers, times unpolarized, and Pretzelocity times Collins. All right, so that's the general idea. That's how we can use experimental data measuring all these angles and doing an angular decomposition of the cross section. Uh, to get access to all those different TMDs. Beautiful. All right, we could also do other processes. I've only given you two examples. There's Higgs, of course, that gives you access mostly to gluon uh, TMD PDFs. And but, you know that's interesting. Uh, that's discussed in the handbook. There's E plus E minus to two observed hadrons. That's the kind of analog of these processes. You know, Drellian was two in the initial state. Semi-inclusive DIS is one in the initial state, one in the final state. And then E plus E minus to two hadrons, as I've shown here, that's two hadrons in the final state. So it would have two fragmentation functions, okay? And so you could get access to products of fragmentation functions in the TMD. And that's discussed in, in section 2.11 of the handbook. So we can use these process, processes to get access uh, from data to TMDs. Now, in order to do that as a theorist, you know, you have, we have this factorization theorem. It's got some stuff under the hood that we have to actually do if we want to make a numerical code that uh, implements everything. It, there's a renormalization group. We haven't really talked about that. There's a whole set of lectures that you'll hear about it, but that comes in. There's pertur perturbation theory that comes in. There's the fact that the fret that in different regions of momentum space, the TMDs could be non-perturbative or perturbative, that comes in. You have to figure out how to deal with that. So I wanna talk through some of those things to give you sort of a general picture uh, of how that works. And again, I'll, I'll try to write more. Let me save these notes, see if there's, before I get going on that, if there's any questions about uh, the general sort of setup and processes.
There's at least one question. I have a few questions um, that may be a miss, but is there any reason why you do some high-end kind of projects with the Chinese data scholar for them for the purpose? I'm sorry, can you uh, have to be close. repeat the question, Chris? Yeah, or come closer. I say that maybe I missed this, but there is any reason why in the Polaris region case, in the initial state, you have a pion and a proton. Yeah, there's no reason. It was just like a choice. Okay. I could do two protons. I could do two protons as well. And the formula would be a little more complicated for two protons, in particular, if both of them are considered to be possibly polarized. So in some sense, making the pion assumption the, the proton formula exists in the literature. Making the pion assumption was just what my way of saying one of the things was unpolarized. And if I had a, one of my protons unpolarized and the other one polarized, it'd be the same formula as the pion case. Um, but in the proton proton case, they both could be polarized and then the formula gets even more fun. Um, but good question. Shojin has Shojin, a question. I see you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I just have a little bit technical question. Like for those angles with cosine and science, are, are they just coming from the, uh, see the lap leptonic part of the diagram calculated in this specific frame? Yeah, that's how you can think about it. Okay. I mean, there's a, you can think about doing a, a decomposition of W mu nu and L mu nu. Right, and then there's uh -huh. some prefactor in the W mu nu and L mu nu. When you do that on W mu nu, you're writing it out in terms of the hadronic vectors, and then you have some scalar object. The scalar objects are the Fs, the capital Fs, the structure functions. And the, the uh -huh. prefactor okay. stuff is all coming from the dot product of the terms in the L mu nu, which you can calculate exactly the L mu nu, uh -huh. with the, the prefactors of the W mu nu that carry the indices, the mu and nu indices of the structure of the hadronic tensor. Okay. Yeah, that's that's where those factors are coming from. When, when I do this uh, tensor kind of decomposition for the W mu nu, um, um, is there a is there a general procedure to do that in an arbitrary frame, or it's really yeah, frame? it's not so it's not so hard to do it in an arbitrary okay. frame. You do it. You can. Yeah, I mean. It, you can ask like, where does the frame dependence actually come from? Uh -huh. And it comes from like, when you take the four vectors and you write them out and you write them with angles, right? You write things uh, into the components. Uh, That's okay. when you're making I frame see. choice. I see. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so let's turn to question, what we Adrian. need. Oh, okay, go ahead. Can you come over here? Can you come closer to the microphone, please? Is the Collins function T odd? Yeah, so when you do time reversal on the fragmentation function, it's more complicated because you have this final state that you're turning into an initial state and you just get something different. Oh, because so. I, I noticed that like the bohr molders times Collins one is the only one that doesn't have a spin multiplied by it. And the bohr yeah. molders is T odd, so. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about what you need to do to implement. So resummation, what is resummation? Well, I've mentioned some, some, you know, that there's renormalization group kind of behind the scenes. Renormalization group is a practically useful tool. And the reason it's useful is because renormalization has to do with lo logarithmic singularities for the most part. And actually we can calculate the logs in perturbation theory to higher precision, to higher orders, then we can calculate non-logarithmic terms because we can use the structure of quantum field theory to get the, at the logarithms. And that's what the renormalization group does. Well, I, I'm not, that's not the purpose of my lectures, but I'll tell you what kind of logs we are interested in here. We're interested in logs of Q over QT. Remember that capital Q is much bigger than QT. So this can be a large log. Alpha S is supposed to be small, but you know some of the data is at very low energies and alpha S is pretty big. Alpha S times this large log could be order one. And in Fourier space, that would be alpha S times QBT, log QBT. And if those things are order one, then you have to sum the logs. 
to all orders in perturbation theory, and the renormalization group allows you to do that. So people talk about renormalization group improved cross sections by carrying out the resummation. And from the handbook, I've taken this little chart to show you kind of what the nomenclature is for that. So when you think about the cross section, you can sum the logs in and exponentiate them. And so people talk about the resummation in the exponent. So there's an exponent sitting here. Um, and when you talk about leading logs, it's like alpha s log squared. That's like a leading double Sudikoff log. But then there's an infinite series and it goes alpha squared log cubed, alpha cubed log four. And that series, that tower is the leading logs. If you sum that up, you're doing a leading log cross section. And then if you go down by a log, one less log, then you have next to leading logs. That's, that's what the name means, NLL, next to leading logs, one less log. Okay, so instead of log squared, it's alpha s log, alpha squared, log squared, one alpha for each log in this column. And you can keep going, next to next to leading log and 3LL. And this is actually the kind of precision that people talk about nowadays, because we have enough information about the anomalous dimensions to do next to next to next to leading. Well, that's too many next, so you say n cubed LL. That's, that's, what, that's what we say. Um, so we'll show you some, some results that are at this order, actually. Um, so how do we get to this formula? Well, what you do is you use renormalization group equations. And I'm not, there's one important point that I need to make from them. So I'm going to present some of the information about them to you. And then I'll make that point and then we'll move on. Um, but I think Duff has a lot to cover in his lecture. So he'll be happy that I've told you these formulas. So the hard function dependent on mu. And actually mu d by d mu, the derivative of the hard function, just like the beta function has a renormalization group equation, the h has a renormalization group equation. And it's the way these equations work is they're multiplicative and I can make them into something that's just an equation with no h on the right-hand side by taking the log of h. So I do mu d by d mu of log h, that's like the log derivative, the log mu derivative of log h is given by what we call the h anomalous dimension the anomalous dimension for this hard function. And it has a general structure, and I won't be able to fully explain why it has this general structure, but I'll tell you what it looks like. It's got a logarithm in it, which is kind of unusual, but that's the way Sudikoff double logs work. There's always a log in the anomalous dimension. And then it has a non-log term. So these functions here are functions to all orders in alpha s, so they'd have a series expansion in alpha s. This one that multiplies the log is always the cusp and what's called a cusp and almost dimension. It's the universal quantity like the beta function that people are very interested in calculating in various theories, including QCD. And for loop calculations of this quantity are now available in QCD. Um, so this is a, a renormalization group equation. And you can solve this equation and get access to the logarithms that are inside the hard function. And now you can do the same kind of thing for the PDFs, for the TMD PDF. So let's take the logarithmic derivative, mu d by d mu, of log of the f in BT space. This is given by some anomalous dimension. I'll call it gamma mu q. It turns out it's a function of mu and zeta in the following form. These, these formulas are coming from the handbook. so. Uh, That's where I'm getting them. There's different notations in the literature for these anomalous dimensions. And the handbook has a nice presentation where it tells you how they're all related to each other, the different notations, because people call them different letters. Um, and that's sometimes confusing because then you know if they're even talking about the same thing. Well, there's a nice little translation. Uh, so you can avoid that confusion when you're reading the literature. So again, there's a cusp term with a logarithm and a non-cusp term. That's the general structure of the mu derivatives. Now these formulas in mu are just like the beta function and the running of alpha. If you, you know, run too low in alpha s, you know you hit the Landau pole, lambda QCD. These formulas too, if you ran too low, well, they have alpha s of mu on the right-hand side, so you'd hit the Landau pole in them too. And you, but you can keep them perturbative the way we, we do in, typically for other RGs by simply keeping mu perturbative. So these are always perturbative as long as mu is perturbative, meaning that the mu, the cutoff is much bigger than lambda QCD. Typically people would not go below one GeV because then you get too close to lambda QCD. So one GeV is a good stopping point. 
Um, okay, so that's kind of classic RG, but just classic RG for these quantities that we've been discussing. There's one more equation because the TMD PDF had this dependence on zeta and that was tied to the rapidity. And that, that was a cutoff too. There was a rapidity cutoff in the game. And so there's an equation zeta by d zeta of log f as well. And this is another renormalization group equation. So I can write this as gamma zeta q. And this one is a function of mu and bt. Or in the literature, it's sometimes called k twiddle. The classic literature, the first convention for it was to write it that way in Collins and Soper. Um, so this is what's called the rapidity anomalous dimension. And writing it in this notation with the gamma sort of is like anomalous dimension. That's what we usually write. And the K is the Collins Soper evolution kernel, the Collins Soper kernel, and these things are the same thing. Well, that's a second RG equation. And if I want to sum all these towers of logarithms that I was showing you up here, I actually need both equations. I can't just do it if I only have one. I need both equations to sum the logs in general. Okay, so that's the purpose of those equations. Now, there's a kind of consistency between the equations that I don't want to go into too much detail about, but there's like the, the, the structure of them is not arbitrary. Um, and in fact, uh, I haven't told you the structure of the, the gamma zeta q yet, but it, it's tied because of the following fact. If I evolve in two dimensions, there's a path principle. In principle, there's a path dependence because in two dimensions, if I want to go between two points, there's lots of different ways to do it. Not so in one dimension, but in two dimensions, you can go between two points in lots of different ways. But it turns out that it doesn't matter. You can go in any path you want and you always get the same answer. And that path dependence relates with the anomalous dimensions for the mu evolution and the zeta evolution. Um, anyway, I'm not going to belabor that point, maybe Duff will have time to talk about it more, but that goes into relating, writing down the following formula for the structure of this anomalous dimension. So the structure of this anomalous dimension, again, it has a gamma cusp, it's actually an integral over gamma cusp, uh, and then it has a non-cusp term, which is just a function of alpha. And it's alpha at the boundary, which in this formula that I'm writing is that I've chosen to be bt. So if I take mu to be bt on the left-hand side, the integral's gone, and I just have this term, mu to be one over bt. But in general, if mu and bt are independent variables, I have this term as well. Now, uh, that's the general structure. That's the analog of like these, these formulas here for this third anomalous dimension. Now, there's something quite different though about this anomalous dimension than the mu ones. Remember what, what lambda QCD is. It's like an invariant mass scale at which QCD becomes non-perturbative. When we're evolving in mu, we have the ability to just stop and not go there. But when we're evolving in nu, we're evolving in rapidity effectively. That's what the, the zeta evolution is, or evolution in rapidity. Um, and it doesn't know about, the, like it doesn't screen you from the Landau pole, no matter what value of zeta you pick. And so the problem with the, with the zeta, uh, not the problem, but the feature of the zeta uh, anomalous dimension is that it's both got perturbative components. If BT, a position, is short distance, that means high energy, then the, the anomalous dimension is perturbative. It's actually known at three loop order. But if BT is, small, is large, then it's non-perturbative. So BT, this anomalous dimension, unlike other anomalous dimensions, has to be considered both in the perturbative and non-perturbative regimes, depending on the value of BT, which means depending on the value of transverse momentum, roughly speaking. So let me make a note of this. Gamma mu, sorry, gamma zeta Q of mu comma BT is perturbative for BT inverse much bigger than lambda QCD and non-perturbative for BT inverse of order lambda QCD. 
Now that's a little wrinkle. So that means we have to sort of have a model or some other technique, people to consider it on the lattice as well for calculating the non-perturbative part of this anomalous dimension. And since it's an anomalous dimension, that's actually gonna be the most important non-perturbative thing in the process. It's also very universal. So it is, it's the same anomalous dimension in, in the fragmentation functions and the PDFs and it's independent of spin. Okay, so there's a lot of things that are predicted by the factorization. Uh, so that's uh, something that we can learn. So why is it, you can even see right away that it's non-perturbative for those, for the BTs of order lambda QCD, because here alpha is evaluated at one over BT, so this would blow up. And also the lower limit of this integral would descend into the region where the mu prime goes to the place where this would blow up. So the formula uh, is becoming non-perturbative in both, both terms in the formula. Okay, so that's some facts that we're gonna to have to deal with when we, we model uh, or when we set up a, a global fitting code, for example. Um, there's sort of more, even more to it. So let's think about how we wanna set up our formula for F. For so one of these scalar Fs that we need to do, have, these, have this form. So what we can do is we can do the following. We can write Fi perturbative times a non-perturbative function. So the sort of, there's dependence on various things, but the dependence on the scales, the mu and the zeta is all captured kind of by a perturbative formula for the F. And then we can just sort of correct for the BT dependence that's long distance by having another F. Uh, so this is a way that um, people think about modeling or putting together the non-perturbative and perturbative information. So what's this perturbative F? Well, you may remember, it was a while ago now, but you may remember that we had a formula for this. And it, that formula was to do kind of an operator product expansion and write this thing in, if the BT is, is uh, in the short distance region to write it as a convolution of the Wilson coefficient C that could be calculated in perturbation theory it gives the small bt behavior, and then a longitudinal distribution f. So that's what I mean by this first part. And then the second part is something that would be not truly non-perturbative in the transverse. But the first part has the perturbative bt dependence, the second part has the non-perturbative bt dependence. So you would fit, if you like, this part to TMD data. You could imagine that you've already fit the longitudinal data, there's much, much more precision data and the longitudinal PDFs, and we know the very well from global fits. So this thing you can imagine, we already know, we just take it out of some uh, global fitting PDF code. And then this thing is the thing that's kind of gonna be the new thing that we model in addition to non-perturbative components to this anomalous dimension. Now there's this, this fact that I did one little thing to you, and that is I took this BT that was sitting here, it would have been naturally just to leave it as a BT, but I changed it. I wrote B star of BT. Um, why did I do that? Well, you see, if I didn't do something, I'd have problems. Let's imagine that I just wrote BT here. If I just wrote BT here, all well and good, but the problem is this prefactor would blow up when BT goes to the words lambda QCD. BT inverse hits lambda QCD, this thing would be infinite. So it doesn't matter what I'm doing with this thing. I'm not gonna have a good description of that region if I do that. So what I wanna do is I sort of freeze this term out such that this term can dominate the physics when BT is of order lambda QCD. And that's what the B star is doing. So B star of BT is a way of shielding the perturbative part from the Landau pole. So it's equal to BT if BT is short distance, but then it, it goes to a constant say uh, if BT goes into the non-perturbative region. And that in that way, it freezes it out in a way that shields you from the Lando pole where alpha S would blow up. Well, that's a little complication, but okay, we can do that. Now it turns out there's more than one way of picking a B star and that's part of the game is to you know, figure out what's a good way of doing it. So I'll talk some about that. Um, and there's a little bit, another little bit of a complication here. And that is that this F 
its meaning of the F and the meaning of the parameters of the F actually depends on your choice for the B star. If you pick a different B star, then you might have to adjust the parameters of the Fs, of the FNP. Um, so that's another thing to be careful about. If you compare two different global fits and they use two different B stars, you would not be able to one-to-one -one compare their FNPs. So this is a, a complication. Okay, so since that's a little bit subtle, let me pause and see if anybody has a question. Does anybody have a question? In the perturbative uh, definition, like where you have the operator product extension, do you just replace the BT in that coefficient with the BT or B star? Yeah, 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 that's right. Thanks. So this should be really a BT star. Yeah. Exactly that. Yeah. Okay. Once you start combining this with the renormalization group of evolution, there's even more possibilities. But <laughs> so for first approximation, it's just exactly that. But there's kind of levels of complication that you can go into once you start combining with the RG. That's why there's a little chapter on the RG in the, in the handbook. You can learn more about the, some of the complications there. Okay. Okay. Any, any other, another question? I don't think so. All right. So there's another, another thing that one can uh, add to, the, to this discussion. Uh, and let me give you an example of what it is by just writing down the Drellian cross-section once more. So remember, we can think about the cross-section in y, Q, Y, and, and QT for Drellian. What we've always been talking about is the leading behavior as QT is small. And sometimes that's called the W term. So then I could put a superscript W on my cross-section and say that this is the term that we've been discussing, which is factorized and it dominates at small QT. So we have a factorization for it, and it dominates when QT is much less than Q as the leading behavior. But if we were to calculate the cross-section in fixed order, or if we were to go sort of back to this formula that I just gave it when QT was large, then there would be corrections to that, perturbative corrections that we could actually just get from calculations in the literature or include. And so we call the rest the Y term. So these are subdominant terms in the QT, much less than Q expansion. And, and they start actually at order QT squared over Q up to some subtleties related to doing cuts on the leptons, but let's not talk about that. So they're usually down by two powers for most things, uh, but they're important if QT gets close to Q and maybe you wanna do a global fit that doesn't like require only small QT, but like large QT too. So you could do that but then you have to include both the W term and the Y term. Um, so important when QT is of order Q, or you know, if you have some low, if your Q is not too big itself, then there's sort of not so much space for the QT to be much less than the Q. So you could also sort of, even in those situations want to include the Y term. It could be an important power correction to include. And you can calculate it, for example, perturbatively. Or you could try to think about factorization theorems for the Y term, but that goes beyond the level of uh, discussion I wanna make here. Okay, so finally, um, we talked about resummation. There's also sort of fixed order. And I mentioned it a few times as I was going through, but like, let me just summarize uh, what the fixed order things are in kind of an item D. So there's H, which it has a fixed order expansion as well as its RGE. There's those CIJ coefficients in the operator product expansion, and there's the Y term. And all these things can be calculated in as a series expansion in alpha S. For the H, you can think of it as kind of boundary data for the uh, RGE equation for H. And the C, well, that's you know coming into the perturbative description of the F at some scale, and it's also boundary data. 
And then the y term is just calculating this contribution of the cross section. All those things you can calculate in perturbation theory put together. So those are some of the, the main subtleties or main complications or main facts that you have to deal with when you're sort of actually using this whole formalism that we set up uh, and making predictions. And I wanna illustrate as kind of my final thing before we end today's lecture, illustrate some of this with uh, two important global fits that have been done in the literature. So I'm gonna talk about these 2019 global fits. One is by Skamimi and Vladimirov, and the other is called Pavea 19 by this longer list of authors, Baketa et al. Um, so they, you know, they're competing groups in, in a way, but there's also some commonalities and some differences. So I'll talk about both the common features and the, and the differences in their approaches, and we'll contrast, and then we'll look at some of the results. So the, these fits focused on unpolarized data. So they're, they're not trying to do a global fit of every possible spin combination. They're just really focused on doing global fit just to the unpolarized data, because you know that's a good place to start, that there's the most data there. Uh, and if we can't understand that, then we're probably going to have trouble understanding the polarized data, perhaps. So unpolarized data and restricted to small QT. So take the data where QT over Q is at least less than a quarter. So we can have some hope that that expansion is converging. And since the quadratic terms are of order QT squared over Q squared, one over 16, and then you're like down at this four or 6% level for the power corrections. So that's kind of one, one input. Perturbatively, they've gone to next and next and next to leading log N3LL resummation and next to next to leading order matching. Uh, actually, for some things, the next to next, next to leading order terms are now known. Um, both for PDFs and TMDs. The Cs are actually known at three loops. That's one order beyond this. Um, they're neglecting contributions from the bull molders, which turn out to be small in the regions that the, of the fit that they did. And they make the assumption that uh, for the modeling, that the flavor dependence is common for this part of the model, which here could have an index i but they're basically taking that and saying, well, let's just pretend it's universal so we don't have any I. So we have a common model for all the flavors. So there's flavor dependence in the perturbative part, which multiplies this FNP, but we'll have a common non-perturbative function for up and down, uh, et cetera. So that's another assumption. People have tried to relax these assumptions. So I'm just telling you what the assumptions are for these particular analyses, not like that anybody's thought that that's necessarily the way it has to work or should work. But you know, if you're going to do something, you have to make some approximations. These are the approximations that have been made. Well, they get good convergence. So you can look at the convergence as you step through orders, go to the towards the highest order, and you do see that the things are converging. So the cross sections perturbatively are very nicely converging as you get to the highest order. Um, there are some uh, differences in the, the approach. These are global fits, which means that they're implementing fits to a lot of different data and trying to systematically see if they can agree with low energy data, high energy data. In the case of the SV19, they actually took both Drell-Yan data and CITIS data. So 457 different bins, you know, data comes in bins. It doesn't come as like a differential smooth cross section because uh, every, everything is binned in all variables. So 457 bins for Drellian, 582 bins for Citus. In Pavea, they have 353 bins and they focused on the Drellian. And these plots are showing you sort of where are those bins. The two groups made the plots a little differently. In the SV19, they show the Q and X spectrum and where the data is. And you have sort of low Q from Phoenix, Compass, Hermes, low energy experiments. And then you have Atlas and CMS and CDF zero, the high energy experiments up here, LHCB even as well, and the small X regime is contributing. So the LHC experiments and the Tevatron, past Tevatron experiments. Um, and likewise, the colors in this plot are showing you the different experiments of the data that they considered in the sort of different cases, like here there's E605, which well, I guess E605 is also here. So anyway, there's some differences you can tell just by the fact that they have a different number of bins. So that should be kept in mind. Now you have to parameterize the non-perturbative things. And they chose to do that with slightly different models with slightly number, different numbers of parameters. You know, it's up to you how you wanna parameterize the non-perturbative things. So these are these FNPs. There's an analog for the fragmentation function 
call it DNP. Remember, we're just doing the unpolarized here. So there's one F and one D. Um, and in the SV19, the TMD PDFs had five parameters. These are these yellow things that I highlighted. Uh, and the TMD FFs had four. In the PVEA, they had more parameters for the TMD PDF. They had seven, shown by these yellow things here. Uh, they didn't need a FF because they didn't have any CITIS data. Remember, they're just doing Drellian. And then there's parameters for the non-perturbative part of the anomalous dimension, the, C, the call and SOPR kernel. And both groups had two parameters for that, that's, which are shown in the blue. Um, one is a parameter in the B star prescription, which is also related to how things are cut off. Uh, that should came right into the anomalous dimension formula, the parameterization of the non-perturbative part in the SV group's case. So there's sort of a prefactor as well as that. Um, didn't have to, but that's how they just chose to do it. So there was kind of two parameters that way, one of them being related to their B star prescription. And then also uh, here in the Pavea group, you have two parameters there uh, and you have a parameter in, your, in their B star prescription that they highlight. So they chose different ways of doing the B star. These are these cutoffs that I was talking about. One of them uh, with a square root, one of them with this quartic fourth uh, root of the ratio of some exponentials. They have different behavior. Um, so that should be kept in mind. You do a fit and they get pretty good chi-squared. So they're actually fitting the data quite well under the restrictions. Going to these higher perturbative orders certainly helped to agree with the data. Uh, earlier fits did not get as good chi-squared at the lower orders. Both the low and high energy data were actually well described. And these non-perturbative parameters from the uh, RAD, rapidity and almost dimension, or from the Colin Soper kernel, uh, they're not so as sensitive to the input PDF set. So if you sort of change the longitudinal PDF from NN PDF to MSPW or other PDF sets, CTEC, then uh, they're not changing, although some of the other parameters would change in the, in the TMD PDFs and the PD, TMD FFs. Um, and they also find that the universality that I talked about for the anomalous dimension is satisfied between the, form, the FF and PDF uh, data sets. So you're getting you know, pretty reasonable values, more precise values for those anomalous dimension parameters, because as I said, they're enhanced non-perturbative corrections because anomalous dimensions multiply large logs. So if you have a non-perturbative anomalous dimension multiplying a, a large log, then it gets enhanced by the large log. So it's a more important non-perturbative correction and that, that means the fit is more sensitive to it. Yeah. I see a question. Yeah, I have a question. Are, are there somewhere plots which compare to different functional forms for B star? Like Very how good. They Next plot. Oh, oh, for the B star, yeah. yeah. Well, I have a plot in my Mathematica, but I don't have it in my talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can throw these into a computer very quickly, right? Yeah, it's just yeah, this little formula and this little formula. Maybe one thing have... I can tell you, one thing I can tell you analytically, which is a difference that you can see, is you can think about expanding these formulas for small b. That's a relevant thing to do because in the region where you go to a small b where things are perturbative, they both start out as b. That that's built in. B star is equal to b up to higher order terms in, in, in the b over over BNP expansion here, or B over B max expansion here. Yeah, so that's built in. In some so, paper, so kind of one can compare with this also. Yeah, so let me tell you one feature that tells you that there's something really quite different about them. When you do that expansion, this one starts off as B plus B cubed, and this one starts off as B plus B to the fifth. So, <laughs> they're, they're, so the Taylor series is even different um, of the two formulas. Thanks. Yeah. And the results that come out uh, for, for example, that anomalous dimension, uh, when you combine it back together with the perturbative, because you better do that or else if you're going to get something sensible. In the non-perturbative regime, uh, so this is BT and inverse GV, it looks like this. So they have asymptotically different structures, like what in the Bavea, you're finding this more rising curves than, than you're finding in the SV. And, I'm also showing here some earlier results from the same groups when they were doing VITS uh, earlier in the earlier literature, but as a 17, which I don't want to go into. Okay, so you, you know you can see that there's still some that the fit form and making sure that everything is like independent of the fit form, we're not really there yet. So 
the things are depending on like what fit form you put in and it's not like NNPDF where we're like, where we're trying to make it sort of completely independent of uh, what kind of fit forms we put into the, the parameterization. But we get some results and they're kind of interesting. We can also plot the TMD PDFs and the TMD FFs. And that's what's shown here, plotting uh, those uh, functions and seeing what they look like. And they're plotting in two dimensions, remember, because this is, that's one of the whole points that we have longitudinal and transverse. So we have B as well as X and the behavior of the function is changing as a function of B and X. Here are shown for the up quarks and the up quark fragmentation for the proton and the, and the up quark fragmentation for a charge pion. Uh, and then there's some color coding related to how uncertain the function is. And then in the Pavea case, they're sort of showing the different X's by one dimensional plots, but just showing different bands and different curves. You can see how things change with X uh, with transverse momentum on the axis. Um, and this is two different scales, Q equals two GV versus Q equals 10 GV for the cutoffs and the they're showing the change in the cutoff here, which is not shown here. So that's some results. So you can actually get plots of the TMD PDFs and get some ideas sort of now how they're looking. And you know, you have some functions here in transverse momentum that are falling off as the transverse momentum gets large, but are kind of dominated in the non perturbative regime, which is what you'd expect. Now, now there's one more thing I want to talk about before I end my lecture today. This was all all unpolarized. So this to do for the unpolarized, relaxing the flavor assumption, relaxing the dependence on the functional form, uh, uh, thinking about relaxing the constraint that QT is much less than Q and including more data. Those things are, you know, things that in these global fits that I presented to you, you know, people thought about these things, but like if doing a complete global fit that sort of relaxes everything at once is not something that's been done yet. There's still plenty of room for, uh, for more work on the subject. But I wanna talk about one thing before ending where we're fitting for data that's sensitive to polarization since we talked a lot about spin polarization. So I'll talk about this paper. Uh, again, it's a high precision perturbative uh, fit. It's a global fit and it's getting after looking at the Civis function. Remember, this is the one that had the sign flip. So it's very interesting. So they're looking at, uh, this is Barry Prokudin and Vladimirov and Alexei Prokudin is gonna be doing some lecture, lecturing tomorrow uh, for you on phenomenology. So he'll tell you even more about uh, phenomenology and fitting to data. But I'll, let me tell you about one result from his paper, one of his papers. So this is an extraction of the Civis function and it's looking at Civis, Drellian and W and Z data. So in the Drellian, you can produce a W and then you have coupling of up and down quarks, et cetera, from flavor. Uh, and that's useful to look at. So the data is 76 bins that come from Hermes Compass, JLab Star, uh, and then Compass with both Drelia, uh, Compass with Drelian as well. And you're, you know, after really testing this relation between the Citus and Drelian, that's kind of a, a target. Use the N3LL. The resumation is is independent of the spin, so you can just use the resumation. They're using SV19. V is the Vladimirov that's also on this paper. They did a flavor dependent parameterization. They didn't include a CIJ here. They just did a flavor dependent parameterization of the Civis function. So they're taking into account in the non perturbative modeling that there could be differences for ups and downs and U bars and D bars. Um, so that's this index Q. So the various parameters have a Q on them because they can change, at least these ones here, these ones don't. Um, and they got some results. They got, for example, they find that the, they get a good fit to the data and they have opposite signs for the Sivers function for the up quarks and the down quarks that come out of their fit. So that's shown by flipping the sign on this one and making them both positive, and plotting minus here and plus here. So that's kind of interesting. But they actually found also that the data was not precise enough to test the spin flip relation, this relation here. And that's because remember that this relation is a, is a flavor by flavor relation. So it would be true for each flavor. I guess I've been calling flavors I in, in this talk, so I'll put a subscript I on it. Um, and it's hard to get that test because if you think about truly what it's doing in Drellian, you're always having QQ bar annihilation. So if you're like, for example, colliding protons for the Drellian, 
or or you're collect you're you're sort of looking at the C distribution often oftentimes in Drayan. And in Citus, it's more like you're directly looking at the flavors. And so that once you put in the flavor dependence, you have kind of more sign flips, and you've got to like test that you're getting access to the same flavor in the Drayan as in the Citus in order to really test the sign flip. And there was enough freedom in the fit that uh, if they tried to just flip the sign, they still got a, you know, there was tension. Here you have 0.88 for the reduced chi squared. Here you have 1.0, but it's not like significant enough to say that you could really test the sign flip statistically. So there's still work to be done and there's still more data coming as you'll hear about in Haigan's talk um, coming up next. And, you know, there's plenty more to, uh, to do on the experimental side. And this will be tested in the future, in particular as a target at the EIC. All right, so we've made good time. I'll stop right there and we can take more questions. Thank you, Ian. Even though we started late, you have plenty of time for questions. So that was my goal. This is your last chance at this school to ask Ian questions live. So take advantage of it. Andrew? I have a question that I'm really embarrassed to ask, but I those are the best. It'll only get more embarrassing the longer I wait. Uh, where is the, where's the line between when theory stops and phenomenology begins? Because I realized I don't really know that answer. Yeah. So you know, you could write down a rigorous formula, and and then there's a question of when I go and you want to use it, am I able to use it in Every like the formula has all sorts of things. It's got flavor and spin. And am I able to use it without making any additional assumptions, right? And furthermore, when I use it, if there's some non-perturbative thing in it, what do I do? If I pick a particular functional form, as is done in these fits, as is done by these formulas, then I'm doing phenomenology in a sense because I've picked a functional form that may not be nature. And maybe my functional form is like, actually there's something about nature that's outside my functional form. Hopefully not, but maybe. So there's sort of the starting point where you did QCD theory, you understood all the approximations, you got to some factorized formula, it was very nice, but now you need to use it. Using it is hard. It's a lot of work to do the using. It's just as much work in, well, I've done both of my career. So I can tell you that both of them are very hard <laughs> or both of them require the same amount of effort. You know, life is hard, but, um, and they're both kind of fun. So um, I'll say that as well, but it's not like just doing the phenomenology part. If you really want to be careful about it is, is any easier than doing the theory in some sense, in my opinion. So the, the phenomenology starts when you start trying to make those kinds of choices. Do you, you know, how do you exactly cut off the data? Do you make these assumptions like the flavor blindness? Is that a reasonable assumption? Is it a bad assumption? What about QED effects? What about this effect, mass effects? You know, there's all sorts of subtleties that, you know, when you were working in your pure theory land, you said, oh, well, the mass of the hadrons is small. Let me drop it. And then you start real, dealing with real data and you realize that your Q may be not that much smaller than the mass of the proton for some of the data. And what do I do? Do I throw that data away? Do I keep that data? Do I go back to my theory and try to improve it and put the hadron masses in? You can do that. Uh, might be the best option. So there's lots of things that when you start dealing with real data, you start going back and realizing that some of the assumptions you may have made as a, as a theorist doing just the pure theory part have to be re reconsidered. So it's not like it's even these two things are independent of each other because phenomenology informs theory and theory informs phenomenology. That's very helpful. So no, Your homework, I want you to ask the same question to Alexei Prokudin tomorrow and see what he says. We'll compare. Any other questions here? Right there. Um, earlier in your talk, you mentioned uh, using different models uh, to calculate TMDs. Um, I was wondering if you could um, sort of explain how, how to choose which model, whether it's a spectator or dyke work, and how to be careful yeah. when discussing like model dependent quantities. Right. Yeah, so I don't know very much about it. I'm not the right person to ask. We do have a whole chapter of the handbook on it, though. So there's a chapter seven, 
all about models. And it goes into a lot of detail from some of the experts on modeling TMDs as to sort of what the choices are and what's better here and what's better there. So I can't really answer your question, but I can answer that there is all the information that hopefully you need in chapter seven. And if you find something that you were curious about that's not in there, I really encourage you to ask because you know the authors will respond. And if they think that you've asked an interesting question, maybe they'll add a couple sentences to the handbook to address it. Um, so have a look at that and see if it answers uh, what you're curious about. Anyone else here? Anyone on Zoom? Well, I'm not going to let Ian waste the last 11 minutes of his time slot. <laughs> let me ask you. Uh... You, you can do that, Chris. It's a, it's Friday. You know the students have would only appreciate having a little more time for coffee. <laughs> really happy to our day here. <laughs> anyway, um, let's see. What was I going to ask? Um, three quarters through. <laughs> I was wondering if you could. Uh, I didn't pay close enough attention to this. Um, so when you show, so you showed uh, these two extractions of the Allen Soper kernel, uh, the non-perturbative part, um, with the two different yeah. B star prescriptions. Yeah. I, I didn't quite capture. So how much of this is the entire difference I see here be, because of the different B star prescriptions and related to, I mean, how seriously do I take the difference between the shapes two sets of- Yeah, good question. So yeah, let me be clear about what I'm plotting. I'm plotting the left-hand side. So I'm plotting the sum of the perturbative plus the non-perturbative in the two cases. It would not be sensible to just plot the non-perturbative because the perturbative is evaluated with a different B star. So this term here and this term here differ. So I actually, when I plot it and when I fit the parameters, that's what I was saying, that it's not sensible to think of this BNP and its value uh, as being independent of the C0, they're tied together. And so you have to plot the whole thing. And that means that it's sensible to, to compare the, the two in the plot. Now, whether the differences come, you know, the differences obviously come from to some degree from the different functional forms, right? Because they have different asymptotics, et cetera. And that's got driving the curves in a particular way. Um, I should also add that there's lattice data that's kind of in the same ballpark as these curves, and that starts to get to the precision where it can start to make some impact on determining which curve is the right curve, but there's lots of systematics on the lattice too, and maybe you'll hear about that in some of the later lectures uh, in the school. But the, the thing that's being plotted here is the sum. From the global fits, that's what you have to do for these B star dependent global fits. So re resolving which set of curves is correct is requires more data and or lattice calculation. Or lattice, that's right. Yeah, I mean, the more data, you could try to get more insensitive to the functional form, right? And have a more general functional form and get like, and that that would kind of be one approach. But I think, you know, the, there's, the prospects for the lattice here are pretty good. A lattice can help inform the fun which functional forms are good choices. Like even depending on like how it behaves in the large BT region, you could say, okay, well, the lattice has told me this is the behavior for large BT, so let me make a functional form that agrees with that, right? And that would be useful. Uh, and we should go to this lattice claim here for this quantity, like better than data, worse than data, 10 times worse, 10 times better. Then no prospects. Um, well, let me think of whether I could show you a plot or not. Um, I have plots in other talks. I just don't know if I could find them in real time. Um, let me just see if I can, if I can find a talk quickly, I'll show you. Oh yeah, I know which talk. Yeah, I don't have it on my, my iPad, so I have to think about how I can show it to you. You can we have, it we have, in, in Slack. Yeah, I can, I can post a link. I'll post a link in Slack. I, in, a, in a talk that I gave the, at this year's Lattice Conference this past summer, I made a 
analysis of all the lattice analysis, a lattice calculations of this quantity in the talk. And so I'll, I'll post a link to that. Thanks, Philip. But it's comparable is the answer. Like the, the uncertainties, the differences that you're seeing in these curves is like, they're not much smaller. It's like the lattice is starting to get it accurate enough. The problem is when you interpret the lattice, there's some assumptions that went into the analysis there and you have to make sure you understand those assumptions to understand the level of which you should interpret. Sure. Like they're working with one lattice spacing and some of these things, right? So there's no extrapolation in some of the quantities that you eventually need to extrapolate. That makes it a little more challenging to just take some plot and say, okay, this is, this is good, ready to go. But all those things are talked about in this talk that I'll post. Um, if, if you start, like, say you already have the PDF, and I'm not interested necessarily in starting from scratch and, and trying to extract the TMD. And in the beginning, you were talking about, oh, could we naively identify integrating the TMD over K perp and get the PDF? Can I flip that backwards? Yeah. If I already have the PDF, are there boundary conditions that I can impose that would allow me to like reverse engineer the TMD? Kind of. That's, but it's already built in. So in the region where BT is small, you have a perturbative description that's in terms of the PDF, okay? That's what this part of the formula is deal dealing with. This goes to one. The models are set up so that if you expand in small BT, this goes to one plus order BT squared. That's part of the assumption in the, in the setup of these models and that needs to be the, true, such that at, large, at small BT in the perturbative regime, you just have this function. And this function is given just by the longitudinal PDF. So that's kind of the inverse of this integral thing that I was talking about. There's some subtleties, but that's basically the picture. So it's kind of built in what you want. It's already in there. Any good theory ideas about how to reduce dependence on the B star description? <laughs> yes. So in this paper that we just wrote that we posted this week, we have a section about the answer to that question. You have five minutes to advertise that section further if you'd like. I don't have to because, <laughs> because my student Lishuan Sun is giving a talk this evening about that. I don't know how much time she'll have to cover it in 15 minutes, but I'm not going to steal her thunder by you know, saying anything now. <laughs> good. Well, that's a good enough answer. Okay. Well, if there are no more questions, maybe we'll, we will reclaim a few extra minutes for a coffee break. And uh, thank you very much, Ian, for these excellent lectures. Thanks, everyone. Sorry I couldn't be there in person. Everyone go have a beer for me tonight after all the student talks. <laughs> and uh, hopefully see you at the rescheduled collaboration meeting, whenever that is. Absolutely. Great. Looking forward to Take it. Care, Ian. Take care, your family. Bye. OK, we'll uh, I'll leave the Zoom call open, but we are taking a break. Uh, I was going to say something. <laughs>